Dear Heavenly Father, please let this time of worship be all about you and all for you. And we love you so much. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. Our God who calls the saved is here to set the captives free. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, 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 oh. stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power, fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, 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 oh. every knee will bow before the Lion. Good morning, everyone. For the mission moment today, I'm going to talk about these bags here because um, it's almost Advent time. And normally what we do is hand out these large bags and ask you to fill them um, with items for our backpack program. Uh, in lieu of the backpack program, we started in March delivering grocery bags like this. And what we need to ask you to do uh, this year is to forego the big plastic bags. And if you would consider buying the items that we need to go in family bags. Uh, we have been delivering to uh, upwards of 70 to 80 families a week. Um, 
we are now at 120 bags a week and these bags contain things like canned goods canned vegetables canned fruits um, meal type things like beef and uh, beef stew or chicken and noodles or hearty soups spaghettios the kids love spaghettios boxes of potatoes both mashed and and the kind that you purchase in a box uh, rice uh, spaghetti spaghetti sauce um, other kinds of pastas mac and cheese is always a big one um, canned meats like chicken and tuna and spam and vienna sausage those kinds of things um, we always put a box of cereal some kind of cereal in we um, put in some snacky types of things that uh, we normally get from Midwest Food Bank. And then we also put in uh, a package of cookies. Um, we try to make it things that kids like as well as adults, because some of our bags go to just adults. Um, these bags are uh, used, um, and here's view of our table, somewhat empty because we packed yesterday and bags are going out today. Um, but these bags are used for people who have called us and said they're short of food um, and unable to pay all their bills. So our way of being able to help with that is trying to take some of the pressure off. We also do peanut butter and jelly. The uh, the 16 ounce peanut butters and jellies. Nothing too huge because we have to be able to lift the bags um, when we're done. Uh, we try to put bread in every week. That bread comes from uh, leftover bread from Publix. And every Tuesday morning, we have a volunteer that goes and picks it up. And then we are able to um, put a loaf of bread or some kind of sweet thing in the bags as well. So. If you would be interested in doing that, in actually purchasing things to put in the bags, we are going to have bins outside the Wesley Hall under the uh, entryway that goes between Wesley and the LEC. We'll put some bins out there. Um, please feel free to bring your bags at any time and put them in the bins and we'll be watching and, and take the stuff in and be using it as we need it. Um, the other possibility, if you're not interested in going out and buying, is we've determined it's about $10 worth of food that goes in each of these bags. And so certainly at any time, not just Advent, but any time that you would like to donate to the food program, um, just put a check in the mail, give me a call, um, talk to the office, uh, send it through the church if you'd like, um, and but designate it for the food program. Um, things are different this year. We're doing things differently. Backpacks have morphed into this for the time. Um, we're hopeful for the day when backpacks can be backpacks again. Um, and when we won't be dealing with uh, not being able to meet together and not being able to do things like have the advent bags. Um, I look forward to seeing you and I love all of you and I pray that you will all stay well. Thanks for listening. Bye. We are living in a beautiful garden. Life on earth is like tending the garden. For the seeds that we sow are the plants that will grow. So we plant the seeds of love.
Hey guys, good morning. So if you've been coming to worship online with us over the last several months, then you've probably noticed that there are two parts to our worship service that happen every week. They happen at two different times, but right near each other. We have our children's message and we have our morning prayer. Well, this week, those two are going to be together because I want to explain how the morning prayer works to you guys and then we can all participate in it together. All right? So you know that Jesus taught his disciples how to pray and he gave them this guideline of when you're talking to God, here's some of the things that you might say. And we call this the Lord's Prayer. And you've heard it, and sometimes maybe when you hear it, and even when you say the words along with, you don't always know exactly what the words mean. So you know our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is, is in heaven. You know this, this beginning of this prayer because you've heard the grown-ups say it so many times. But let's think about what it would sound like if we said it kind of in our own words, okay? 
So when we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Maybe we think of that like, Dear Heavenly Father, we think you're awesome and we love you so much and your name is really important and holy to us. And then when we say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If I think of that in my own words, I think, God, I want this world to be just the way that you want it to be. Help me to be part of making that happen. And then give us this day our daily bread. Help us to have everything that we need physically, like food and water, and spiritually, like knowing God and feeling close to God. Then we say, forgive us our trespasses. Help us to forgive other people who trespass against us. That means that we're saying, I know that I mess up sometimes, and sometimes I mess up really big. God, please forgive me when I do that. And help me to forgive other people when they do that too. And help me to understand that we all do that sometimes. Help me to not hold grudges against them. And then Jesus says we should say, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So we're asking God to keep us from the things that lead us to sin and to help us to stay away from those things and to stay on the path that he would want us to be on. And then we ended up by saying, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And that's like saying, pulling it all together and saying, Whatever you want is what I want. Your kingdom is amazing and you are the absolute best. And I just honor that and help me to do that in everything I do and say in my life. Pretty cool, right? So when we do our morning prayer here, we always have a little bit before that, that our thoughts that some, whoever is leading the morning prayer has they've given it some thought throughout the week and they have some specific things that they would like to pray for. So sometimes when you're coming up with a prayer, it's a great idea to write some things down. So I wrote a few things down if I were leading this prayer, what I might say. So I these are the things I came up with. I, um, I wanna thank God for keeping us safe in the storm. And I want to thank God for our church and our church family. And I want to thank him for helping us to find ways that we can worship together online. And then I have some things that I want to ask him for help with too. Because, you know, when you're going to God, sometimes you have these things that you just, you want to make sure that you ask for help with those things. Um, and I want to ask him to watch over some people and things like that. So that's how I came up with what I would say for a morning prayer. So the person who leads us in the morning prayer, which will be me today, says the things that are on their heart and their mind that they want to say to God as we're in worship together. And then we all pray together. When you're in your houses and you see the words come up on the screen to the Lord's Prayer, do you say it along with the people who are praying on the screen? Because you can, just like you were in the church building praying the Lord's Prayer. You can do it in your own living room if that's where you're watching our worship service. So I hope that you're praying along with us right out loud. So now let's do our morning prayer together as part of our children's message. And you can think of the things that you might say to God in prayers of your own, too. 
So here we go. Dear God, thank you for keeping us safe in this recent storm. Please watch over anybody who was in the way of the storm. Help the people who experienced flooding and high winds, help them through that time. God, thank you for our church and for our church family. We love you and we love them. Thank you for helping us to find ways to worship online and stay connected to each other and to you, even when we can't be all in the same room together. God, please help us to follow you and to put you first in our lives. God, help the people in our lives who we know who are sick or going through difficult times right now, God, please hold them in the palm of your hand and watch over them. God, please help the grown-ups in our church as they're making important decisions and help us to remember to pray for them all the time as they're making those decisions. God, help us as a church to have the money that we need to do your work so that we can offer hope and help on our island to all of the people who need it. Help us to remember that you love us even when we're going through weird and difficult stuff, God. Please help us to just count on the fact that you are right there with us and that you are loving us every single minute of it. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, are you ready to say it with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That was really cool. I'm glad you prayed along with us. I love you guys. See you later. scripture this morning is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Then each went to his own home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered round him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such woman. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, if any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin.
Good morning, church. Um, three weeks ago, we started a series uh, called The Line Between Good and Evil. And one of the things that we talked about that first week was the, the idea that, um, that there is this um, dichotomy, there's this uh, dualism that we like to think that we're good, other evil is out there somewhere. And Scripture challenges that. Jesus challenges that. And it, the reality is that the line between good and evil actually runs through all of us. We all have the capability of both. And so we have to struggle and, and we have to ask God to help us in that struggle in uh, resisting evil even in ourselves, but also in others. And then two weeks ago, we talked about uh, the devil and um, took a look at uh, how the church, how this idea of the devil and how this um, belief about the devil uh, has evolved over the course of thousands of years, uh, going back to Jewish history. And... Uh, regardless of what you believe about the devil, whether you believe it's that just the devil is the personification of all that is evil, or that the devil is a real person, a real being whom we struggle against. Uh, either way, we struggle against evil, and the devil cannot make us do anything because God has given us authority. And we can, we have the power we have the authority to resist evil in all of its forms. And then last week we took a break uh, to respond to all of the, the things that seemed to be swirling around in our culture and felt like we needed to talk about uh, some things. And so we just pressed pause on this good and evil series. Uh, and now today we're picking it back up. And today we want to talk about uh, a concept called systemic evil. Uh, and so the, the idea that evil that is institutionalized uh, and present all around us. Dr. Beverly Harrison gave this definition of systemic evil. Systemic evil denotes diabolical structures that pe perpetuate misery, corruption, and wrongdoing. It's a machine that functions without any real control or oversight by any individual. In fact, it is the con if any conviction or repentance of any cog in the device, it actually doesn't negatively impact the machinery at all. The evil continues, even when one person turns away from it. And so there's this really, this real powerful sense of evil uh, at work in the world and at work in even in the structures of the world. Now we see some snapshots of this uh, in scripture uh, and we see uh, Jesus challenging the systemic evil of his day. Uh, you might remember the time when Jesus uh, got mad in the temple and started overturning uh, temple tables. And uh, now we certainly could do a whole sermon on that. But what is going on there essentially is that Jesus is challenging the way in which people who were coming to uh, sacrifice at the temple were being exploited and being taken advantage of by the religious officials themselves. And that's why Jesus was so angry and he challenges the whole system in, in a very vigorous way. Uh, in a very uh, visible display um, and overturning tables and, and actually swinging chains at the officials. Probably not quite as exciting, uh, but no less challenging of the status quo and, and, and the systemic evil is the woman caught in adultery. And they bring her to Jesus and uh, Jesus challenges what they want to do. They want to stone her to death. In fact, they want him to, to participate. But Jesus refuses and actually calls into question the very system that would allow them to stone her to death. 
kind of points out the fact that there are, there are two people involved in the adultery and all, you've only brought one of them, which was perfectly uh, normal in that time. And Jesus is pointing that out and resisting against it, actually uh, calling it out for what it is, the systemic evil that it is. Many of Jesus' parables were uh, uh, addressed and railed against the systemic evil of his day. And then the quintessential pointing out of systemic evil is the crucifixion itself, the crucifixion of Jesus. Crucifixion, by the way, in Jesus' day, was perfectly legal. As barbaric and violent um, and grotesque as it was, it was perfectly legal. And by Jesus, the Son of God, submitting himself to that, he shows how grotesque and horrible it really was. And it changed the world forever. And we're going to talk about that in just a bit. But systemic evil is present uh, throughout our history. Um, one example is uh, the, the way in which um, blacks have been treated in this country. Uh, I, just this past, uh, I think it was about two weeks ago, I was rem uh, reminded of something that happened in one of the communities I served before coming to Pine Island. Uh, I was served in Ocoee, Florida. And Ocoee, Florida was um, the was a dangerous place uh, for African Americans to be for much of the 20th century. Uh, and on election day, over 100 years ago, actually 100 year, years ago this year, uh, there was a massacre uh, of African Americans because one man, one black man, decided he was going to vote. He had been given the vote, the right to vote. Uh, by a new law. And when he tried to exercise that vote, it not only led to them coming after him, but it led to chasing out all the blacks out of the entire community. And the reason I heard about it was that this past, uh, about a couple of weeks ago, one of the churches in Okoe was doing a service to hopefully begin to heal the deep wounds of that, even a hundred years later. Now I feel connected to that because the church that I served, one of the churches that had merged to form that church that I served was First Methodist uh, of Ocoee. And some of the lay people in First Methodist Episcopal Church back in 1939 or back in the 1930s or the 1920s, rather, when the, this massacre happened, were the very perpetrators, members of that Methodist congregation. George Wallace, notorious segregationist, was a Methodist layman. Systemic evil exists even today. And there's lots of talk in the culture uh, about that. That's a, but, but one of the things I want to talk about is what do we do? How do we respond? And uh, there are at least three different responses. You probably could come up with more, but I, I want to just talk about a few. First is you, we can acquiesce. We can just avoid, and, and we see this uh, from time to time. We can just adjust, avoid, and accept the whole powerlessness of it. Because when we confront, when we see, and we're able to see systemic evil, it, it seems so big, it seems so entrenched, it seems um, that we are powerless to do anything about it. And so a lot of people just simply acquiesce or just say, well, that's the way it is. I don't, I don't know that we could do anything about it. Um, and so people live out their days in an uneasy, fearful way, devoid of the full measure of God's grace that we were meant to experience because that's what systemic evil does is it keeps us from experiencing the full measure of God's grace. So one uh, example is to acquiesce. I will always remember my the first appointment as a pastor. I was a student pastor in Crawfordville, Georgia, Tolliver County, Georgia. 
And the best way I can describe my initial reaction um, uh, being a becoming acquainted with that community is it must have been what it was like to step back into the 1940s or 50s. Uh, and I was sent there in 1993. When you encountered African Americans in Tolliver County, Georgia in 1993, when you would walk on the sidewalk and they were coming the other way, they would step off of the sidewalk to get out of my way. It unsettled me, and it it made me realize, you know, I was so uncomfortable with that because I've never thought that anybody ever needed to get out of my way just by what, because I was walking on the sidewalk. But just the way in which that systemic evil was just present throughout that culture. Some of the people in my own congregation would talk about the, the blacks knowing their place. That's acquiescence. That's one response to systemic evil. Another response is to get violent, retaliatory, uh, you, you, to, to retaliate, to return evil with evil. And certainly uh, Malcolm X and others uh, are examples of this, that uh, but what norm, what, what uh, basically happens when you that is that it creates more problems than it solves. It breed violence breeds more violence. Hate breeds more hate. To come against systemic evil with more evil just multiplies the evil. So, there's a third response, and that third response has often been called nonviolence. To resist evil nonviolently with the intent of moving the perpetrators towards justice, towards love instead of evil, good instead of evil. So, another example of evil. Uh, systemic evil is in our retail manufacturing industry. Uh, and I'm just going to trace this a little bit, so uh, stay with me. Uh, businesses close down. Just uh, imagine a business closing down their American manufacturing and shipping it overseas to save money. We've seen that happen over and over over the past several decades. There are uh, third, world, third world companies who bid for the contract. Uh, and to keep over their overhead down and production up, the workers put in long hours with very little pay in dangerous environments. And because of the rise of manufacturing in these countries, uh, a lot of their real estate is eaten up and other businesses are closed to make room for manufacturing work. Manufacturing jobs become an opportunity and a trap for third world citizens. And there is a lack of defined standards in many countries which allow uh, mass corporate pollution. Meanwhile, over in America, the loss of manufacturing jobs shrink the economy. The American middle class workers feel that they have to shop cheaply to make ends meet. Uh, th that causes the demand for cheaper products at the end of the supply chain puts more stress and more demand on the supply side. And so the need for cheap products makes the, plop, the problem cyclical, just continuing to repeat itself over and over. So you see how systemic evil spreads through different systems, different companies, through the whole culture, even across um, geographic borders and national borders, systemic evil can spread. Human, tra human trafficking is an example of human uh, of systemic evil. Systems systems de designed to benefit the rich and powerful and to to you know what I alluded to earlier keep others in their place. Systems uh, put in place to suppress votes. Systems of government corruption 
healthcare systems that are only available to people who can afford it. These systemic evils include, but they're not limited to, the complex uh, networks, social and otherwise, and also institutional structures that perpetuate racism, sexism, inefficient political processes, nationalism, which means uh, my nation is better than your nation, we're better than you are, um, destro uh, destruction of our, of our creation, wage inequality, xenophobia, and others. Paul described this in Ephesians uh, this way. He said, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. We, as the people of God, are called to do something about that. We hear the call uh, that many have made when they see injustice, when they say injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And in the weeks and months uh, following the murder of George Floyd, a lot was spoken and I spoke, even spoke of the fact that when we are silent, we become complicit in that systemic evil. Systemic evil is intimidating and disempowering. It, it makes people less than they are. It makes people less than what, who God made them to be. Now, what do we do about that? I mean, as I said earlier, how do we, as people of God, do something about systemic evil? We look to God's answer, and God's answer to systemic evil could be called systemic good. Jesus talked about it as the kingdom of God. A completely different set of structures that are meant to replace, eventually replace, all of the evil structures of the world. And infuse that system with kingdom values. The, the systemically evil practice of separating children from their parents at the border and keeping them in cages was put to an end by people rising up together and demanding that it change. Systemic good, overcoming systemic evil. The Bible says overcome evil with good. Civil Rights Act in the 1960s was passed as a result of years of nonviolent protests led primarily by leaders in the church. Systemic good. Working against systemic evil and eventually seeking to replace it. Wars have been stopped. Laws have been changed. Evil practices have been chased into the shadows by the systemically good kingdom of God. And what I want to say to you this morning is that you who are followers of Jesus Christ are, system, are, are citizens of that kingdom. You are citizens of that systemic good that is meant to eventually replace all the systems of evil in our world. We can, none of us, not one of us, can do it by ourselves. We do it by relating to each other in the way that Jesus taught us and then challenging 
the systems around us to adopt kingdom values. But even more than that, to just show them what it looks like when you treat people with kindness. When you treat them as if they are just as valuable as you are because they are. When you seek to bring people up out of oppression and help them get on equal standing with others. When we do that together, when we help people with food insecurity, when we help people find jobs, when we, when we do all the things that Jesus has taught us to do, we demonstrate for the world the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God is that system of good, that systemic good, that will someday replace all those systems of evil. That's what you're part of. That's your citizenship. And that's what we're called to be. Let's pray. Dear God, so often we feel powerless when we see evil in the world, especially when it seems to be systematized uh, in our structures, in our laws, in our culture. Lord, help us be the people who demonstrate a different system. A system of divine good that you brought into this world. The kingdom of God that Jesus taught and demonstrated and taught others to demonstrate along with him and which we seek to do even now. Lord, empower your church to be a force of systemic good. Tear down the, the bastions of systemic evil in our, in our country and in our world. Help us to see the things that we can do and, and join with others to do. To bring your kingdom to fruition. And to see your ultimate good conquer all that is evil. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Sorry. <laughs> All right. All right. Ready? Go. May God go before you to defend you. Behind you to protect you. And walk beside you to befriend you. May God go beneath you to uphold you. Rest above you to bless you. Dwell well within you to comfort you. Amen. Amen. I I think that was perfect. One take. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with love. Bind us together with love. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.